Hey everyone, Shabba Gamer here, and we are back with another episode of SWE Octane. We've got some big debuts for you this evening. Of course, if you've seen Mayhem a couple of days ago, you will know exactly who they're going to be. If you've not seen Mayhem, then you are in for a hell of a ride. Octane has just taken a massive step forward. And here we go. Oh god, I've recorded this so many times now, it's just not working at all. So the Revival are first out, they're going to be taking on the Dream Team, and the Revival are being accompanied to the ring by Arn Anderson. Okay. It's an interesting development here. Arn Anderson, of course, made his uh, debut for Octane last week when he lost to Cesaro in a dark match. And now here he is, accompanying... The revival to the, uh, the ring. We, we know from previous universe modes where Arn Anderson has tried to align himself with the revival that he, he feels very much like the revival are a, a real big thing, a real big up and coming tag team. And he feels that his experience factor can really help the revival step up to the next level. And he sort of sees a lot of himself in the revival at their age. And with the form that revival been in, they, they got a, a good win over the, uh, the Young Bucks. Uh, a few weeks back now uh, in a number one contendership match but then they went on to lose the championship match at the pay-per-view two time splitters so maybe just maybe the experience factor of Arn Anderson can really help them step it up to the next level in this universe mode I'm sure that's what they're hoping as well I'm sorry if I sound a little bit drained this is fourth or fifth I've lost count myself now it's my fourth or fifth attempt at recording this match now it's not going well for me I must admit um, it's just double, I don't know what it is, but for some reason, every match has ended on a double countout, and I just I don't really want to waste uh, a match like this on a double countout. It's just it's a little bit annoying, and it's it's normal. I would keep it if it was genuine. I would keep it, but it's it's real poor AI that's causing the problems at the moment, and that's the frustrating thing. And hopefully, we're going to see a bit more uh, or a bit better here now not quite sure it seems to be like the same things happen in match after match after match not quite sure why I don't know if there's a pattern or because the match is loaded up it follows a penciled in pattern I don't know I really don't know to be honest I'm sure we'll figure it out as we go along though won't we But here we go then. Greg Valentine the left, Brutus Beefcake on the right, the Dream Team. Supposed to be a squash match here, but based on a few days ago, of course, it's probably not. Uh, of course, if you've seen uh, the last episode of Mayhem, you'll know exactly what it is. I mean, yeah, it wasn't the best, was it? But that is, it is what it is, isn't it? Wilder now then. Let's start things off here against Brutus Beefcake. You can see Dawson in the background there just had his back to the match but discussing things with Arn Anderson. A little bit of tactics there maybe. As Dash getting a very early aggression here on Beefcake. You know what? In the time I've been recording this one match, I could normally record an entire episode. That's quite, quite frustrating, I must admit. I could be on to recording the next show by now. Oh, well, it is what it is. Atomic drop there by Dash Wilder. And a boot to the back of Brutus Beefcake as well. And another boot to the back of Beefcake. Wilder brings him up and another boot to the back of Beefcake. Beefcake's got a, a real pounding here by Dash Wilder. Dash now dropping an elbow right in the face of Beefcake. Russian leg sweep. The double Russian leg sweep now by the Dream Team. The Dream Team been quite a good, um, quite a good job of tag team really so far in the last few matches. 
Um, but I'm sure in the long term the revival can pull this one off. I've seen some right bogus stuff so far, by the way. I just it's it's been one of those. Every now and again, I come across a match which is just absolute hell to record, and this has been that match so far. It really has. I've seen a shatter machine where um, Dash Wilder was a non-legal man turned around and neck breaker the referee straight away. He's like, what? Why? Why would you do such a thing? Can't believe you've done this. Valentine now into the reverse chin lock. Uh, not really a move that you ever expect to get a submission with. It's just a case of trying to uh, slow the match down, regain a little bit of energy while keeping your opponent grounded and almost taking energy away from them. I think it looked to me anyway like uh, Dash was going to hopefully go for a, a tag there, but he gets caught by Valentine, that big vertical suplex. There's the pin. One, two, only a two count. Valentine now front chancery. Drags Dawson into the middle of the ring and twists the arm, but Dawson fighting back with a boot in the gut of Greg Valentine. Now up on his shoulder, you see Scott Dawson once again discussing things with Arn Anderson, backbreaking out by Dash Wilder as well. Now matches here this evening for you. Uh, we have got after this one Kalisto versus Mandrews versus Hirumu Takahashi in a triple threat match. And there's a pin here by Dash. One, two. Scott Dawson's uh, pathfinding there was absolutely diabolical. He literally went. He, he, it's almost like he didn't realise he can go through the centre of the ring. He has to like stay within arm's reach of a rope. I don't know. But it's, it's a good position to be in. It looks like uh, Dawson in... Uh, Dawson, that's uh, Dash Wilder. Dash Wilder in firm control of this match. So here we've got Kalisto versus Mandrews versus Harumu Takahashi coming up next in a triple threat match. The winner of which will qualify for a fatal four-way ladder match for the Cruiserweight Championship at our upcoming pay-per-view. Uh, also tonight, we've got another tag team match. We use the Hype Bros takes on a debuting tag team. Of course, if you watch Mayhem, you'll know who they are. We're going to see Drew Gulak. Again, another new person to the roster. Uh, who I've not written down on my list, actually. Drew Gulak will be uh, facing off against another debutant here. Who Again, you'll know who it's going to be if you watched uh, Mayhem the other day. And then our main event this evening will be Ric Flair going one-on-one -on -one with Daniel Bryan. Uh, a bit of a, a mixed bag there for a second as Greg Valentine taking the turnbuckle pad off as Arn Anderson threw in a chair. It looks like this match is about to get a little bit more hardcore as Dream Team working together now and Dash getting a few chops for his trouble. Now taking... Uh, I don't think that counts but he did angle it towards the chair but who knows. Who knows with this game it's, it's crazy enough as it is. Dawson, this should count. I don't know if that does count either, no. I'm just thinking about things where you drop people on the weapon and do extra damage, but I don't think either of those are counted, really, do they? Dawson now bringing Beefcake back up. The Beefcake fighting back. And Beefcake in control of this match in a short period of time. Referee finally disposes of the steel chair. Now in comes Greg Valentine once again. Dawson sending Valentine into the corner. Can he follow up with anything? No, Valentine fighting back. And there's a lot of reversals coming out of the Dream Team here. They're showing a lot of experience themselves. Maybe not a... Maybe the uh, Revival's more cohesive team. But like I said, the experience factor of, um, of both Beefcake and Greg Valentine, who have both been in several different... Uh, tag teams across their careers, of course. Valentine now looking for a fatal four, a uh, fatal four way, looking for a figure four leg lock, and it's really well positioned as far as possible. You can weigh it away from uh, from Dash Wilder, who does come across and break it up, though. A real cluster of things going on at the moment. I'm not quite sure. I looked away from the screen for one second to make sure I was still recording and everybody was down. I'm not quite sure what just happened, to be honest. 
but uh, Dawson trying to crawl across the wing to, to Wilder. But the Dream Team taking control. It's only a two count now. Dream Team again in full control, but Dawson turning things around, sending Brutus Beefcake in to the turnbuckle. Springs him off to the far side. That's the one that Greg Valentine took the pad off of as well. And the damage has been done. It sort of backfired on Valentine that. And again, the referee getting taken out. He seems to get taken out quite a lot, doesn't he? Leg drop again by Scott Dawson. There's the pin. One, two. Oh my God, he's won. It wasn't the best match in the world, but screw it, I'm sticking to it. The amount of times I've bloody recorded this, I'm bloody sticking to that. Yeah, I, I'm... <laughs> it was bad, wasn't it? It really was bad. But the Revival are going to pick up the ranking points here for the win over the Dream Team. It was... Yeah. I, I, I don't know what to say. I really don't. I've been recording this match now for well over an hour. And this is the first match that's actually ended. It wasn't very good, I admit, it wasn't a very good match, but still, at least it ended. <laughs> and that is a big thing for this universe movement. It's, it's not... I, I sort of over-exaggerate a little bit, I think. It's not that often that I get a really bad match, but today was that match. This match was diabolical from every sense of the point. I had three or four double count-outs. I've seen some stupid AI with people attacking the referee after finishing manoeuvres, but we do finally have a victor in Scott Dawson and Dash Wilder. The Revival do get themselves some points and this could be the beginning of something special. The alignment of the Revival with Arn Anderson. This could be something special. I like this. I like where this is going. And here is our second match of the evening. Again, a triple threat match that determined the uh, first challenger in the Fatal 4 ladder match at our next pay-per-view for the Cruiserweight Championship. Mark Andrews, Kalisto, and Harumu Takahashi. And here we go. This should be a good one, this one. Of course, Takahashi made his debut last week when he defeated Kushida one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, Kushida obviously still in the King of the Cruiserweight Tour. Is he still in the King of the Cruiserweight Tour? No, I'll take it back. No, he's been knocked out, hasn't he? Has he been knocked out? Where am I? Where's my paperwork? <laughs> I've lost everything. Ugh, I've got it now. Let me have a see if I can find it. Um, yes, he was. He was knocked out by Matt Seidel in uh, in the second round. So Kushida is doing pretty well in the King of the Cruiserweights. I think uh, he's not got an opportunity so far. I, I've got three triple threat matches planned out over the next three weeks to, to fill up this this ladder match. However, of course, I have announced on the King of the Cruiserweight Tournament because of how badly Sin Cara did in the first round, he is going to have to be forced to defend that Cruiserweight Championship against somebody at the King of the Cruiserweights Tournament. Now, I think he's going to have to defend it against Kushida because it was Kushida who demolished Sin Cara in the opening round, which means Kushida would then be scheduled to wrestle twice at the pay-view, which is not something I like doing, but it is something that we're probably going to have to do. There you go. There you go, I suppose. Um, but yeah, Sin Cara could be out. Sin Cara could... I think... The problem is is that I've got... I had a triple threat plan for next week, and I realised that I've actually lost all three guys in that triple threat. I can fit it back in, but it depends on what happens at the King of the Cruiserweights. Now, uh, we're going to find that out, of course, in a few days' time. Tomorrow, we've got the three semi-final matches... We've got Pete Dunne versus Will Ospreay. We've got Christopher Daniels versus Kalisto. And we've got Matt Seidel versus Petey Williams. Uh, the winners of those three will go on to a triple threat match at the King of the Cruiserweights final. Where we've got some uh, really cool matches lined up for you, actually, at the King of the Cruiserweights final. Uh, including uh, another punishment I've put in place. I've been a bit of a, a, bit of a tyrant in this, uh, this uh, show, this tournament as well. Um, because of the poor performance of Juventu Guerrero, who I thought would be one of the guys who would really uh, thrive in this sort of tournament. He got knocked out in the first round, so I am making him defend 
his place on the Octane roster in an open challenge. So anybody who wishes to be part of the Octane roster can take that challenge with Juventud Guerrera and take their place on the Octane roster. Takahashi here, like I said, made his debut last week defeating Kushida. And considering Kushida's going to get himself a shot at the Cruiserweight Championship, and he lost to Takahashi last week, it sort of shows that Takahashi can't be far behind him in getting that championship match. So there we go Kalisto, Mark Andrews, and Hirumu Takahashi. One of these three guys will be in that 4 1 ladder match. The bell goes, and we are underway. World's strongest slam there by Mark Andrews. <laughs> Not really the world's strongest slam, though, is it really? And a jawbreak by Mandrew as well. Mandrew's taken early control of both uh, both Kalisto and Takahashi. At the moment here we've got a Brit, we've got a Japanese, and we have a Mexican wrestler. So a real sort of travel around the world. And the first part to these triple threat matches are always quite of a, a cluster because everyone's sort of doing a little bit of damage here and there. It isn't until we get a bit more damage going that, um, that we start to get more opportunities to potentially hit some bigger high-profile moves. Just the way the AI works in this game. Crucifix bomb there by Kalisto. Now into a tornado. Heads to take that. Th that, 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 that tag match has got me in such a state that it's half past 11 on a Sunday morning. I'm drinking cider. That's how bad that match was. That's, it, it drove me to alcohol. That match. That's how bad it was. <laughs> but there you go. <coughs> oh, coughing my guts up now as well. So here we go. That's what I was saying about uh, earlier with the uh, the the way that the game mechanics work. You see, Kalisa now has a drop to the outside, and this allows Takahashi and Mark Andrews to go at it singles wise on the inside. Andrews back in the ring, and they're uh, catching both Takahashi and. Kalista with kicks. Kalista comes running back with a kick of his own. Now Mandrew dropping to the outside. Kalista there with the jaw break on Hirumu Takahashi. I'm hoping you can't hear the traffic in the background. It's, it's still very, very warm, isn't it? And uh, I have got the, the window open, which is... A, I, I live on a main road. It's a bit noisy, but hopefully it's okay. I've had no complaints before when I've done it. I don't like it myself, though, personally. Mainly because people can hear me screaming and shouting through the window as they walk past. But there you go. It's it's a price we all pay. Mark Andrews standing, shooting star press there on Kalista. Now jumps over the top. Into a springboard center on Kalisto as well. Kalista now rolling. Mark Andrews through boot to the side of the head. We've seen that quite a few times in the King of the Cruiserweight tournament. Oh, Takahashi, clever there. He saw Kalisto lining up. Uh, Mark Andrews is so big and Takahashi comes running through with the, the neck breaker into a gut buster and a big boot. Takahashi heads up top. He's stalking Mandrews as Mandrews gets back up to his feet. Meteora. I thought he might stay in there for the pin but decides against it. Kalista now back in the ring as well. Gets caught with a jawbreaker there by Takahashi. He's in firm control and a super kick by Takahashi. Right to the face of Kalista. There's the pin. Mandrews is down. One. Two. Oh. Takahashi's getting pretty close here. He's been in dominant form so far, but Kalista with a Saito suplex. Now the Hurricanrana as well. And I have sort of said the winner of the King of the Cruiserweights tournament will get themselves a shot at their brand's Cruiserweight champion. But of course, remember, P.T. Williams is still in there and he is currently the uh, the Adrenaline Cruiserweight champion. So maybe we'll have to give him something a little bit different if should he win. Sakahashi taking Kalisto up. Oh, he went for... The air raid slam, I think, but Kalista managed to roll off the top. Now kick to the side of the face of Takahashi. Mandrews. Mandrews, come on, man. You need to pay attention. He gets caught out. Kalisto snap suplex on Mandrews. Kalisto dropping into the pin. One, two. Only a two count. Takahashi able to kick out. 
Mandrews drop kick. Mandrews. Kalisto drop kick to the back. Kalisto stalking Takahashi. Mandrews is still down. Sleeve del Sol legs are hooked. One, two. Mandrews sees it. Oh. Takahashi able to kick out. Ooh. That was big. Two count again by Mandrews on Takahashi. Takahashi slides free from Mandrews. Into the turnbuckle. Mandrews fighting back, catching Takahashi. That drags him away from the ropes. Standing Spanish fly. Up to the top he goes. Shooting star press. There's the pin. One. Two. Oh, Kalisto, you're a joke, man. <laughs> you are a joke. Well, there we go. Mark Andrews has won the match. The AI is not our friend here today, is it? It's really not being our friend, but there you go. Kalisto completely missed the pin when he tried to break it up. And it is a victory for Mark Andrews. So Mark Andrews is the first man guaranteed in that fatal four-way ladder match. In fairness, Sin Cara, the champion, is not guaranteed in that match yet, is he? Until he defends his belt against Kushida in a few days' time, then we'll know for sure. Good little match, though. I'm surprised Takahashi did not come out on top of this one because he really was looking dominant for, for quite a long period of it. There's a Salida del Sol. I'm surprised as well that Takahashi was able to kick out of this, to be honest. Mark Andrews didn't get there in time. Then Andrews into a Russian leg sweep on Kalisto and then tried to steal the pin on Takahashi himself. But again, it was only enough for the two. My leg's gone dead. Ugh. And then there it was, the shooting star press. Into the pin. Kalisto tried to break it and completely... <laughs> I feel bad just watching that. I really do. This is an advert for 2K18. It can't be worse than 2K17. That's all you got to say. Right. It's time for another tag team match. Hopefully this one will run a bit smoother. And here we go. So this is the debut of a team that we have traded from Mayhem. Of course, we had to trade both Ricky the Dragon Steamboat and Rey Mysterio away from Octane to get hold of these two guys. But I think they suit our roster fantastically. I really do. And it'll be interesting to see just how well they can do on this roster. And hopefully they can do a little bit better than the crap we've had so far from the Revival. Um... God, that, that match is really... That's really made me salty, that match. Really has made me salty. But there you go. And they're going to be taking on the Hype Bros. Another opportunity at a squash match that hopefully is going to go our way. Hopefully going to go our way. Uh, but Zack Ryder and Mojo Rawley, a team that a team that are, are pretty effective so far. I don't think they've won a match, though, have they? I bet they have won a match. Knowing them, I bet they've won a match. Yet they defeated Golden Truth. Defeated Golden Truth, that's the only time... Nope. Yep. Yeah, they defeated Golden Truth, that's the only time they've wrestled together. So they're actually one for one in tag team matches. Hmm, interesting. Very interesting. So Mojo Rawley and Zack Ryder take on Trent Seven and Tyler Bate. This should be, in fairness, a bit of a one-sided match.
in theory. We're going to start things off then with Trent and Zack Ryder. It's, it's a good one, this, because, like I said, I think both Trent and Tyler Bate are potential for, of course, tag team championships, but maybe even singles run here as well. Tyler Bate, I would class as light enough to get himself in the cruiserweight division. Uh, both guys, of course, could also go for the, um, the European Championship as well. So I think it's a really good trade for me. And uh, we were struggling. I, I always struggle with Rey Mysterio. I'm not quite sure what to do with him most of the time. And it was case in point once again when we had him. So he has moved to Mayhem alongside Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. And it's PJ Toby's problem now. Of course, we've also got one other massive, massive debutant coming up for you in the next match here this evening. Somebody who we traded away. Uh, we traded for by giving away Eddie Guerrero. So it gives you a sort of idea of roughly how, how the quality of the person we're bringing in is. Neckbreaker there by... Tyler Bate and so far Bate and Trent Seven are dominating Zack Ryder. Maybe it's the Revival because I've always had problems with the Revival. The, I think it's maybe something to do with the AI. The Revival's just not written very well. It's the Shatter Machine and so forth. We'll see what happens. If this is a if this is a smooth tag team match, then it could be the Revival that's the problem. I'm not saying the Revival are not a good team. Just saying that the way they're written on this game might not be very good. Because it's always the Revival and American Alpha we have the issues with. Which I'm hoping it's not, because I plan to use a revival a lot more moving forward, with the whole Arn Anderson situation as well. Ah, uh. uh -huh. we'll find out. We'll find out as time goes on, I suppose, won't we? Tyler Bate now wrenching back at the neck of Mojo Rawley. Mojo breaking free, and bring Zack Ryder back in. Maybe not the best idea. Zack's taking quite a lot of damage in this one. Uh, both uh, Zach and Mojo doing a good job there of distracting Tyler while the other one got a cheap shot in from behind. And now Zach dropping his body weight on the arm and the elbow of Tyler Bates. See, this is why I say about the AI being funny. What, what, what just happened? I don't know what just happened. <laughs> it was bizarre to say the least what just happened there, wasn't it? But there you go. Uh, boots the face there by Zach Ryder. And there's the Rough Rider. Is that the Rough Rider? I've got no idea. I must admit, I don't think I've ever probably watched a Zack Ryder match. Um, it could be the Rough I think the Rough Rider is his finisher, but it's very similar to that move, isn't it? That's like a super Rough Rider. The Mustache Ride. Nice belly-to-belly -belly takedown there by Tyler Bate. Now bringing Zack back up to his feet. Yeah, I can see Tyler getting an opportunity. Oh, nice move there. It's like a half Nelson slam. Mustache Mountain. Mustache Mountain. See, I don't know what to do with these guys. I had an idea, but I'm not quite sure. We've got quite a lot of stuff going on as it is, haven't we? Do. Hmm. I'm going to have to plan this one out if we are going to do it. It doesn't matter, does it? No, I could do it. I could do it. It doesn't matter. I could do it. I could do it. I haven't talked about the dark matches yet this evening, have I? Curtis Axel defeated R-Truth one-on-one. And um, Pete Dunne defeated Enzo Amore with Big Cass at ringside one-on-one -on -one as well. So uh, points for Pete Dunne and Curtis Axel. That was the Rough Rider. There's the pin. One, two... God, why a why a squash match is not working at all? Like there's a clear twenty rankings points, a clear twenty stat points between the hype bros and and uh, the Mustache Mountain. And there was a clear thirty points between Sumerian Death Squad and Los Matadors. I don't understand why. It, it's obviously not. I don't know. The stats just don't seem to have that massive effect anymore on the game. You'd think at a 20 stat gap, you'd think there might be a surprise victory every now and again. But at the moment, it seems like the people with lower stats seem to win more matches. Two count there. I think it's a win here for... A win here for uh, Hype Bros. And all of a sudden, you have to include him in 
the tag team championship picture because that would be two wins in two matches which would be more than anybody else I think so far apart from time splitters they've had two wins in two matches what on earth is Mojo doing that is the most disgusting move I've ever seen in my entire life I don't know what to make of this I really don't know what to make of this so of course um, Mustache Mountain had an opportunity to win the Mayhem Tag Team Championships only a few days ago at the Extreme Warfare pay-per-view were unable to defeat the Broken Hardys and I don't think that really made PJ Toby's mind up I think PJ Toby looked at his tag team division saw it was quite strong and looked at what else he needed and that's when I sort of jumped on the bandwagon and offered him this trade and he begrudgingly accepted. He's got two pretty good single stars, and I've got a pretty good tag team. Now, Octane's tag team division was pretty strong anyway, um, but it does give me the freedom to remove a tag team or two, because, of course, with Christian going to Adrenaline, it means we no longer have Edge and Christian as a tag team. Um, with Goldust going to Mayhem, we no longer have the Golden Truth as a tag team. The Singh brothers have left the roster, per uh, not permanently, but temporarily, so they have now uh, been removed from the tag team rankings as well. So... We will be getting um, the Singh Brothers back soon. Um, but I'm just trying to plan it out at the moment. I'm using their core slots for something else at this point in time. Elbow drop by Zack Ryder right to the heart of Tyler Bate. Well. The Hype Bros have won. What a freaking episode, I tell you. Well, you try and you just you just try and it just doesn't work. Ah! Oh. Well, Mustache Mountain had an opportunity to have an easy victory. Shades of mayhem. I don't know what's going on here with the tag team division at the moment, but certain teams are really, really punching above their weight, and one of these teams, quite evidently, is the Hype Bros. A clear 20 ranking points lower, so a clear 20 stat points lower than Mustache Mountain, but able to pick up the victory quite easily. There was the elbow drop. For some reason, Trent came in the ring and decided not to move and just got wiped out there by the running SDO by Mojo Rawley. And that is enough for the Hype Bros to get the win. I am a massive... What's the opposite of advocate? I dislike the Hype Bros with quite a passion. And unfortunately for me, it looks like I'm going to have to use them a bit more because now they are going to be forcing their way into that tag team championship picture. Hmm. I may just have to give them an opportunity at some point. I'm going to have a look at that. I think I'm going to have to, aren't I? Well, let's see what happens. And here we go with our next match. Another debut on this one I'm really excited for somebody who get in here for Octane for me is a massive coup and I cannot believe that PJ Toby allowed me to have him of course we have lost well of course Drew Gulak joined us last week uh, he lost our truth in his see again with the, the job and matches are just not working too well for us are they really squash matches Drew Gulak was supposed to get a nice victory last week over our truth uh, but instead our truth defeated Gulak great um, but Gulak here and now is going to be playing the opposite role as he takes on our other debutant uh, like I said we had to trade away Eddie Guerrero to Mayhem to get a hold of this guy but I still think even though we lost Eddie Guerrero we've done fantastically well um, to get who we have got and of course if you watch Mayhem you'll already know if you've not watched Mayhem sit back and relax and get ready for the debut of the incredible incredibly talented Mr. He's milking it. He's milking his entrance. It is... Kota Ibushi. There he is. The better version. I've managed to find the... The community creations is so poor. I don't know if anyone else had any trouble. I had to type in the word Kota Ibushi about 11 times. Just type in the same name coming out typing it in coming out typing it in coming out typing it in on the 10th attempt of typing in the same words over and over again 
finally this version popped up. Because this is the best version, I think, on the PS4 of Kota Ibushi. So, um, yeah, I'm glad to get him. And I'm so glad that we've got him on Octane now. Somebody who I was a little bit... I'll say I was annoyed, but when PJ Toby booked him into... Uh, PJ Toby booked him into Mayhem, I thought to myself, that's fine, if you want him in Mayhem, that's absolutely fine, but... I always thought he suited a Adrenaline or Octane roster a little bit better. And now we finally have got him here on Octane. Kota Ibushi is someone who could be European champion. He could be Octane champion. He could be Cruiserweight champion. And maybe we might have to give him that opportunity next week in the Cruiserweight championship. Because we do need to never triple threat match next week. Um, yeah, we could do that next week, actually. We've got a massive... Our main event next week here on Octane is going to be Kenny Omega versus Hiroshi Tanahashi versus The Rock in a triple threat match to become the number one contender for the Octane Championship currently held by Edge. So that's a big one, that is. Uh, next week as well, we have got for you uh, Diamond Dallas Page taking on Pete Dunne one-on-one. -on -one. Another interesting match. I've uh, got that triple threat match to uh, qualify for the ladder match as well. Of course, already Mark Andrews in that match. Um, we've also got Adam Cole scheduled to take on Zack Ryder one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, which, based on Zack Ryder's current form, that could be a very good one for him. I've currently got down Cesaro and Sheamus to take on Enzo Amore and Colin Cassidy in a tag team number one contendership match as well. Basically, just two tag teams that have not really had much of an opportunity. And it's a do-or-die situation for both of them. One of those two teams will go on to face off against the Tide Splitters at the pay-per-view. And of course, at that pay-per-view, Kushida could be wrestling twice. Depending on what happens at the King of the Cruiserweight final in a few days' time. As Kota Ibushi now heading up to the middle rope. And it looks like Kota Ibushi, at least, knows how to deal with a squash match. He's in firm control here of Gulak. I'm a big fan of Drew Gulak as well. I, I really like him. I know him uh, from his Combat Zone wrestling time. Someone's uh, in my front garden for no reason. Yeah, I know him from his pro wrestling, uh, from his combat zone wrestling. He wrestled there for quite a bit. Um, he was, it was quite funny. He didn't get involved himself in any of the sort of death matches or so forth. He was more, he was very much the same gimmick he's got now. Where he's doing the no fly zone on two or five live, the hardcore, the um, the the the, the no, yeah, on two or five live, the anti high flying. He was doing a similar thing in combat zone wrestling where he was against. He was against hardcore wrestling. He was trying to bring proper wrestling to combat zone wrestling. And he did a very good job at it, actually. It was a, it was a good little gimmick he had. And I was so glad when he, when he got picked up for the CWC. And if I'd, have, if I'd had a bit more time, if we had a bigger cruiserweight tournament, then uh, maybe Drew Gulak would have been involved in that. Can't see why not. Good take down there by Kota Ibushi on Drew Gulak. And a huge clothesline, knocking Gulag's head off. They're getting further away from the ring, which is a little bit of a worry, just based on um, double countouts, which we have had a big problem with so far this evening. Of course, a double countout would be a draw. Neither man would gain or lose any points, which is not really what Kota Ibushi wants. He wants his uh, five points here to add. To He's pretty high in the rankings already. I think he comes to us with a uh, oh, good old Drew Gulag there breaking the uh, referee's count. Nice lad. Yeah, I think. Uh, Ibushi comes to us with quite a lot of ranking points already in the bag, which is fantastic. Um, or even more, actually. Didn't he win? Did he win? Did he win? He, he, I think he won, you know. I think he actually won at Extreme Warfare, didn't he? Which means he's got a load of ranking points if he won at Extreme Warfare. Let me look at my, look at my paperwork again. Where's my paperwork? Where's my paperwork? Oh, I've not, I've not marked it off. I'm pretty sure that Kota Ibushi won at the Mayhem pay-per-view, which if he did, means he's on a lot of points. I mean, a huge amount of points. I have got him scheduled in, actually, next week as part of a fatal four-way for the number of contendership of the television championship. I've lost me bloody paper. There's the Ibushi bomb, though. There's the pin. One, two, 
and Kota Ibushi continues to build momentum. Now, this is the question now. Do I put him into the Cruiserweight Championship picture next week? Or do I put him in the European Championship picture next week? He replaced Eddie Guerrero, and Guerrero is who I had penciled in in that uh, in the match for the um, number one contender. Well, I had it, I've got it penciled in as Cody Rhodes, Jay Lethal, Christopher Daniels, and Eddie Guerrero. I might leave that. I'm gonna leave that as a triple threat, you know. And I'm gonna put Ibushi in the cruiserweights. Ibushi can bring some real quality to the cruiserweights. So Ibushi is gonna be in that triple threat next week um, to be part of the uh, the fatal four-way cruiserweight championship match at the pay-per-view. But a great debut victory here for Kota Ibushi, the only man of the evening to actually make his squash match look easy. And here we go, our main event of the evening then. We have got Daniel Bryan, the man behind the Yes Movement, taking on Ric Flair one-on-one. -on -one. This will be an interesting one then because both guys are submission based, mat wrestlers I suppose, really quite technical, like to work down body parts, like to work down the body parts pretty well before finally trying to lock in their submission hold, so that's pretty good, I like that. And I like the idea of this match, I think we've already had this match once haven't we? Have we done it once? Um, what have we done? No, we did Del Rio versus Daniel Bryan. And Ric Flair versus Jay Lethal. So this is a first time match here in our universe mode. Of course, both uh, Daniel Bryan and Ric Flair were involved in the Elimination Chamber match. So both now trying to continue building up the ranking points as much as they possibly can. And pushing forward to try and potentially get themselves back in that championship picture. Of course, next week we already have our number one contendership match based. Uh, it is going to be Kenny Omega versus Hiroshi Tanahashi versus The Rock. But after the pay-per-view... With either Ric Flair or Daniel Bryan getting the ranking points here, it could definitely push them into that championship picture. And is the music of the revival here coming? What's going on here? The revival are making their way to the ring. This is a bit weird. I don't know why the revival are making their way to the ring here. The game is so bugged, and it's so bugged. So freaking bugged. It's just bugged more than bugs are bugged. So Revival are making their way down to the ring. Well, we know that Arn Anderson and Ric Flair are very good friends. Are we seeing Enforcers here? For Ric Flair? It's certainly looking that way. Certainly looking that way indeed. And Ric Flair's made his way down to the ring now as well. It, it, I apologise for this game. I, I, I can't keep apologising for this game though because it's out of my control. But it just doesn't work, does it? It just does not work at all. There you go. We see Ric Flair now in the ring against Daniel Bryan with Arn Anderson, Dash Wilder and Scott Dawson all at ringside. It looks to me like we've got some sort of stable forming here. Some sort of new age horseman. And Flair taking early control over Daniel Bryan now dropping his body weight on the knee of Daniel Bryan. Ric Flair really in control this match early on. And uh, I seem to, the main event seems to be a lot more one-sided for some reason than uh, the, the lower card matches. I think the lower card matches, everyone's so desperate to um, to show what they can do because they know that they're not going to get a lot of opportunities. Guys in the main event are the guys that are top on the roster. So, yeah, it's a bit of a strange one, isn't it? Big right hand there by Daniel Bryan now hooking the arms of Ric Flair in a dragon suplex. Of course, Daniel Bryan, once known as the American Dragon over in Ring of Honor. Bryan now head his way up to the middle rope, followed up by a big back center on Ric Flair. Went for the stomp, but Flair avoids. Taking Bryan up, but Bryan catching Flair in the face with a knee. And there's a Northern Lights suplex by Daniel Bryan. 
kick in the face of Ric Flair as well. Followed her up with a knee strike to the face. Daniel Bryan winning the crowd on now behind him as he locks in a reverse dragon sleeper. And of course, the, I think the experience factor of Arn Anderson and Ric Flair are going to be trying to help move the revival onto the next level, but it's also very good for, for Flair to have this sort of entourage behind him. A little bit of uh, a little bit of extra power behind him. Says what he wants now. And he knows there'll be people behind him on his side to help him fight. At the moment, I'm not sure Ric Flair needs it at this point in time. He's pretty much in a dominant position. Flair catching Daniel Bryan with a drop toe hold. Daniel Bryan with a pin. One, two, only a two count. Bryan now bringing Flair back up. There's the suplex. Flair catching Brian with the uppercut. And it's a very really interesting one. I think both these guys' styles link very, very well. Very well. Brian now bringing Flair back up. Oh, kick to the back of the leg. We've seen this before. The combination of strikes. Continued strikes. Brian now bringing Flair back up, drags him into the middle of the ring. Into an angle slam. Now lining Flair up. Could he potentially go for a label lock? He does, middle of the ring. Is Flair going to tap? Been a decent night so far for the revival. They got a, a, a victory eventually after hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. That was like a TNA taping. That was just me keep recording the same match over and over again until we got the actual uh, until we got one that was half decent that we could actually put on telly. No Flair fighting free from the label lock. As Arn Anderson now on the turnbuckle distracting the referee. Be nice if the um, be nice if the managers work together. For example, if Arn Anderson would distract the referee, then the revival would slide in behind and maybe do a little bit of damage to Ric Flair. Uh, Daniel Bryan, should I say. Doing damage to Ric Flair would be an awful idea. There's a chair in the ring now as Flair catching Daniel Bryan. Ah, we're going to see the figure four. Locked it in. There it is. Bryan struggling now. He's going to have to tap here, is he? Or can he survive? Can he roll it over? Of course, you roll it over, you reverse the pressure. Well, it looks like he has got enough power in him to roll the submission over. Both these guys managed to escape their opponent's submission hold so far. Again, Arn Anderson up on the apron. Daniel Bryan fighting free. Oh, Daniel Bryan rolling Ric Flair onto that chair. And referee not even noticed. There we go. Now referee just finally noticed. Referee was too busy playing with that chair. Daniel Bryan's got it. Daniel Bryan's got the victory over Ric Flair here. Arn Anderson is not impressed at all by the situation. Arn Anderson saying that Daniel Bryan dropped Ric Flair on that steel chair. However, it's Arn Anderson's fault the chair was there, I suppose. The heel tactics have not worked here this evening for this new horseman stable. And Daniel Bryan picks up the 10 ranking points for picking up a win in a main event of a show. And that is definitely going to help him out, push him back towards that championship pitch. There it is there. Rolled uh, Ric Flair through onto that chair. Arn Anderson can't believe it. He said Daniel Bryan should have been disqualified for that. But it's Arn Anderson's fault the chair was there. He stood it in the ring. And Daniel Bryan is victorious. As Ric Flair slides out the ring now. The new horseman successful in the tag team picture earlier on this evening. But main event wise, Ric Flair struggling. He needs to turn this universe mode around. That's two losses in a row for him if you include the Elimination Chamber. But Daniel Bryan picking up some much needed ranking points. Will be moving forward in that championship picture. Maybe next month to try and earn himself a championship match. He may be 
a, a, a European Championship match for Daniel Bryan? Hmm. Ooh. Okay, that's just tickled my fancy. Okay, I'm going to play around with that idea and see you in a few days' time for some more SWA. Because if you have enjoyed this, like and subscribe and all that other good stuff. I've been Chabby Gamer. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow for the rest of the King of the Cruiserweight Tournament. Bye. Play my shame, the one, two, two. Play, 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 play.